welcome, and thank you for learning more about the Holocaust that took place in Europe between 1933 and 1945. I am Jordan Worthy, and my friends Abby Slezak and Libby Rager had the opportunity to travel to Europe over the past summer to visit the places affected by the Holocaust. This trip was made possible by the generous contributions of the Community Foundation and the Abe and Janet Bierman Fund. Abe and Janet Bierman were a Jewish couple who lived and ran a successful business in our area who had a deep connection with their Jewish heritage. They have contributed much to the community over the past few years to help ensure that the Jewish culture in our community lives on and is remembered. Before World War II began, Germany had a large Jewish population totaling 525,000, which made up approximately 0.75% of the country's total population. Before World War II, the Jewish population in Poland was 3 million people. The Jewish people made up almost 10% of Poland's population. Pre-war Czechoslovakia, which is present-day Slovakia and the Czech Republic, was home to 357,000 Jews, which was 2.4% of the total population of the country. In total, Europe was home to 9.5 million Jews. These 9.5 million people made up nearly 2% of all of Europe's population. The Reichstag in Berlin was built in 1884 under the guidance of Wilhelm I and Wilhelm II as a way for the government to become better connected with the citizens of a newly unified Germany. It was to serve as a symbol of democracy and freedom to the German people. However, what started as a symbol of freedom would soon come to stand for hatred and injustice. Soon the Reichstag would be draped in flags and banners bearing the swastika of Nazi Germany and instead of the voices of diplomats and congressmen, the main chamber would echo with the voices of Heinrich Himmler and Joseph Goebbels. It all began in 1933 when the Reichstag was set on fire. Adolf Hitler, who was Chancellor of Germany, used this event to fuel anti-Semitism, which is prejudice, hatred of, or discrimination against the Jews. The event also allowed Hitler to persuade German President Paul von Hindenburg to pass legislation to suppress the rights and liberties of all the Jews living in Germany. It was the last major event before Adolf Hitler became both president and chancellor of Germany, allowing him to wield absolute power. While in Berlin, we visited the Topography of Terror Museum, an outdoor museum running along a portion of the Berlin Wall that documented some of the horrors of the Nazi regime. This museum showed that the Jews were not the only recipients of horrific treatments from the Nazis. Many other groups also suffered at the hands of the Nazis. For example, the Roma Gypsies were persecuted because of race. Catholics were persecuted because Nazis saw the church as a threat to their authority. And the mentally and physically ill were subjected to horrible experiments because Nazis found them to be worthless, weak, and unable to aid in the creation of a master race and nation. The Topography of Terror Museum acknowledges the horrific dehumanization the Nazis enacted throughout their regime. The Bebel Platz is the site of the burning of the books by Hitler in 1933. During this event, over 20,000 books were burned. In the city square today, a memorial for the burnt books is visible. The memorial is an empty bookcase under a glass square in the ground. The bookcase is large enough to fit all 20,000 books that were burned to commemorate the event. On the glass, there is an inscription. That was only a prelude <clears throat> where they burn books. They will, in the end, also burn people. Monsters exist, but they are too few in number to be truly dangerous. More dangerous are the common men. 
the functionary is ready to believe and to act without asking questions. This quote by Primo Levi, an Italian Jewish chemist, writer, and Holocaust survivor, illustrates the important job that we as human beings have. We must speak up when we see injustice. Not enough of the people who saw what was happening to the Jews spoke up, because if they did, they might have been the next target. However, if we don't speak up for other people, there may be no one left to speak up for us when we need it. The Brandenburg Gate is one of the most iconic symbols of the division of Germany during the Cold War. However, today it is a symbol of unity and peace for the country of Germany. During the Cold War, the Brandenburg Gate became one of the eight gates from West Berlin to East Berlin, normally not open for East Germans who were not allowed to leave. After the Berlin Wall came down in 1989, the gate was open to traffic and over 100,000 people came to it to celebrate their freedom, making it a symbol of peace and unity. After the war, Germany was split up, separating Berlin into East Berlin, controlled by the Soviets, and West Berlin, controlled by the Americans. Due to the Marshall Plan, the United States was able to help European allies and West Berlin recover from the war. However, the Soviet Union did not allow the United States to help East Berlin, so it was never able to recover and progress. Many describe the split cities as going from a movie in color, which was West Berlin, to a movie in black and white, which was East Berlin. Still to this day, East Berlin is not as modernized as the Western side, but the city is united and flourishing today. The Berlin Wall was a barrier that divided East and West Berlin from 1961 to 1989, which was built by the German Democratic Republic. The wall went up overnight, separating families for years. The East Germans were very rarely allowed to leave, a strip of land in between the two walls was called no man's land because Germans were hired to patrol that area and shoot anyone that was trying to escape on sight. They were no longer shooting at the enemy, but they were now shooting at their very own people. It was not until 1989, 28 years later, that the wall came down and the city was reunited. Most of the buildings in Berlin's older sections have one particularly striking feature that cannot be unnoticed. Many of the old buildings have bullet holes in them. The German people have assimilated this historic aspect into their modern culture. They seem to have come to terms with the events of the past, as tragic as they may have been, and they wish to keep the buildings as they are, as visible and historic reminders of the past but they also want the buildings to stand for something much greater. They want the buildings to symbolize hope, remembrance, and reconciliation. The citizens of not only Berlin, but all of Germany want to be reconciled with their past and want the events that took place 70 years ago to never be forgotten in the hope that eventually hatred and injustice will forever be purged from the earth. This memorial to the children killed in the Holocaust helps us to see even more clearly the injustice and dehumanization shown throughout the Holocaust. Children were among the first to be sent to the gas chambers. Furthermore, children who were not immediately gassed did not survive their time in the concentration camps. This memorial tells how the victims of the Holocaust were not only adults, but also innocent children. The East Side Gallery, gallery is a one-mile portion of the Berlin Wall on its eastern side that was restored in 1990. After the wall was repaired, artists from all over the world were invited to paint murals on the wall. There are about 100 paintings in total. This painted wall represents freedom for the world. The Memorial to the Murdered Jews of Europe is located in the center of Berlin, Germany. Peter Eisenman was the artist and he created an abstract memorial. 
The memorial was made up of 2,711 concrete slabs, all of the same length and width, but all of different heights. The design is supposed to create a haunting and chilling feeling. A controversy arose halfway through the assemblance of the memorial that the company making the concrete slabs also produced Zyklone B during the Holocaust, which was the gas used to kill the Jews in concentration camps. However, after some thought, they realized that most companies had some tie to the Nazis and many of them did not have a choice, so there was not much that they could do. Throughout Germany, small gold bricks inscribed with the names of those who were ripped from their homes and killed in the Holocaust are placed in sidewalks. With over 27,000 bricks placed, these stumble stones are the most widespread Holocaust memorial in Germany. These stones are placed in the sidewalks outside of apartment buildings and homes where victims of the Holocaust once lived. Inscribed on the stones are the names of the victims, the concentration camps they were taken to, when they were taken, where they died, and the date of their deaths. These stones were placed so that people will stop when they see them and remember the people who were killed in the Holocaust. These stumble stones help us to realize that the Holocaust affected people just like us. One of the most fascinating and perplexing areas that we stopped was actually a parking lot. To be quite honest, had it not been for the tour guide's explanation, I would not have known that where I stood was the site of Adolf Hitler's Führer bunker. When the war ended, the citizens of Berlin and the rest of Germany did what they could to erase Nazism and fascism from the country by removing all Nazi banners and memorabilia. They even covered Hitler's bunker with asphalt. It serves as a true testament to the German people. The act shows that even today, the citizens of Germany are deeply saddened and ashamed by the events of the past and take no part in glorifying or condoning Nazism, fascism, or anti-Semitism. I actually find it a fitting end to Hitler's pursuits. He is not glorified in any way. No flag, no memorial, no holiday. Just a parking lot. His victims receive the memorials and the remembrance. In fact, the memorial to the murdered Jews of Europe sits just 100 yards away from Adolf Hitler's bunker. And in total, there are 14 major memorials throughout the city of Berlin built to honor the 150,000 Jews who perished in Germany. After two days in Berlin, Germany, we traveled by train to Warsaw, Poland, which was the next stop on our journey. One of the first things we got to see in Warsaw was the Warsaw Ghetto. Within the Warsaw Ghetto was a small bridge which connected the smaller ghetto to the larger ghetto. A memorial to this bridge is in place where the bridge used to be. Unique streetlight pools are a symbol of the bridge's existence today. Throughout the confines of the former Warsaw Ghetto, Apartment buildings still stand and contain occupants. This neighborhood is where the Jews were contained by the Nazis. They lived in these apartments, sometimes with many families occupying one apartment. Life in the ghetto was extremely hard and terrifying. There was often a shortage of food, fuel, and other basic supplies. The Jews lived in fear of the Nazis coming to take them away. From the ghetto, Nazis would send the Jews to concentration camps and plan to eventually liquidate or get rid of all of the Jews in the ghetto. Ghettos like this existed all throughout Nazi-occupied Europe. The ghetto wall was built in Warsaw as a way to contain the Jewish population and to keep them from having contact with any of the other groups in Warsaw. The ghetto wall was hastily built, almost as though it were built overnight, and it didn't encompass a large area either, so the ghetto was small and extremely crowded. To add to the torment of those inside, the Nazis did not allow the Poles or any other Jewish sympathizers to give any form of aid to the Jews living inside the ghetto. 
During the winter months, in fact, there was little food, housing, medication, or clean water. Many men, women, and children starved, froze, and died of diseases. The only time the torment of the ghetto ended for those trapped inside was when the ghetto was liquidated and its people were taken to Treblinka, a death camp where, mo where most people were murdered in the gas chambers shortly upon arrival. The Umschlag Platz was a deportation center where the Jews awaited their fate before being shipped to a concentration camp such as Treblinka. Jews were only held in the center two times during the year. Once in July when it was 90 degrees and another time in January when it was only nearly 9 degrees. Thousands of Jews died in this place and it is now a memorial to honor them. Plaviak Prison was a prison in Warsaw. It was originally used as a prison for male criminals, but it was taken over by the Nazis during World War II for political prisoners and, the, and those the Nazis thought needed special attention. The Nazis deported many Poles from here to concentration camps, and it was here that the Nazis executed the remaining members of the resistance fighters during the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. This bronze memorial tree is located on the grounds of Paviak Prison. Originally a live tree, people would place remembrance notices on the tree to remember those who were killed in the prison or missing persons notices for missing loved ones. The Jewish resistance group, also called the ZOB, held the Nazis back five weeks which was one week longer than the entire country of Poland held them back. They believed that they could either die at the hands of the Nazis or die trying to defend themselves. With this, they began smuggling weapons and explosives into the ghetto. There is now a memorial at the site of their mass grave. The leader of the Jewish resistance group was Mordecai Anilevich. They met in a brothel because they believed that the Nazis would never suspect a meeting in such a place. Unfortunately, the Nazis were more powerful and trapped them inside, burning it to the ground. For as dark a time as the Holocaust was, there were still some incredible men and women who continued to be sources of light and hope for all people. And Dr. Janusz Korshak was no exception. Dr. Korshak ran an orphanage for Jewish children inside the Warsaw Ghetto. For many, his orphanage was a place of peace in a world utterly consumed by darkness, fear, and chaos. He took in and cared for as many children as he possibly could until one day the Warsaw Ghetto was to be liquidated and its residents, including the children under Dr. Korshak's care, were to be sent to Treblinka, a death camp near Warsaw. Dr. Korshak was respected by the Waffen-SS and other high-ranking Nazi officials, so he was offered a chance to leave while his children were taken away. Dr. Korshak chose to die rather than to leave his children. He was sent into the gas chamber at Treblinka along with all his children, which numbered approximately 500. His story of sacrifice shows that even in the darkest of times, there are still those who put others first and become a light a source of hope for others. While in Warsaw, we visited the Museum of the History of Polish Jews. It is an informative and interactive museum spanning 1,000 years of history. This museum showed that the persecution of Jews had been occurring for hundreds of years. It also showed what life was like for thousands of Jewish families before World War II. Many of their traditions were easily recognizable as things that we do today, from having family dinners, to hanging out with friends, to going to school. These parallels help emphasize the, the humanity that we share with the Jewish people affected by the Holocaust. This museum also exhibited the bravery of the Jewish men and women who fought back against the Nazis in the ghettos and camps. In many of the camps, underground networks were established to help those who were struggling with illness and extreme cases of starvation.
This was incredible because it became almost impossible to trust anyone in the ghettos and camps because people would try to save themselves by revealing such dealings to the Nazis. From Warsaw, we traveled by bus to Krakow, the second largest city in Poland. How do you mourn for six million people who died? How many candles does one light? How many prayers does one recite? Do we know how to remember the victims, their solitude, their helplessness? They left us without a trace, and we are their trace. This quote by Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel depicts the entire purpose of this presentation, to spread the stories of what happened during the Holocaust in order to honor the six million victims so that they are never forgotten. Albert Macht Frey, Work Makes You Free, hangs above the entrance of one of the most infamous concentration camps, Auschwitz, to instill a false hope that this was merely a work camp. 1.2 million people walked under the sign to their death. Auschwitz was originally built by the Polish for use as housing for soldiers in the Polish army. After the Nazis took over, it was turned into a death camp. The prisoners were packed into barracks with a lack of space for the people. Actions in the barracks affected everyone. If one prisoner from a barrack escaped, 10 other prisoners from that barrack would be taken and killed. Block 11 was the location of the special torture cells the Nazis used to house political prisoners and anyone suspected of being a part of the underground. There were standing cells where prisoners were forced to stand for the duration of their stay, suffocation cells, darkness cells, and starvation cells. One such cell belonged to Maximilian Kolbe, now a saint, who took the place of a man who was to be sent to the cell to warn prisoners about escaping. Colby survived for 10 days in the cell and was killed by lethal injection after those 10 days. Some of these barracks have been converted into museums that include original sinks, toilets, and bunks, as well as Nazi offices. Also, throughout the barracks are hallways of photographs of the hundreds of people who were killed in Auschwitz. These photos were taken after the prisoners had arrived at the camp and were stripped of their dignity. These photographs helped us to feel as though we were among the prisoners. Surrounding the encampments we visited were a multitude of guard towers. Those who were in these camps were watched constantly, and every move they made was under constant scrutiny. If a person stepped out of place, did not work hard enough, or tried to escape, he or she ran the risk of being pointed out to the guards on the ground or being shot from the guard towers. This added to the fear that those in the camp were feeling. If a German soldier felt like doing so, he could simply shoot an unsuspecting person on the ground for no reason at all. This added to the fear because the prisoners held in the camps knew that death could come from anywhere at any time. Prisoners' belongings were taken from them upon their arrival at the camps. They were promised that they would be reunited with their belongings, but they never were. The items remained in Nazi custody. These shoes are a testament to the lives of the men, women, and children from whom they were taken. However, these shoes, along with other belongings and hair clippings, are beginning to deteriorate. Therefore, it is critical that we share their story and existence, for some of the physical evidence of the Holocaust is beginning to disappear. The prisoners were forced to use trough-like sinks. They were also required to use communal toilets. They were only permitted to use the facilities at predetermined times, often only once in the morning and once in the evening. Among the many atrocities that occurred at Auschwitz, the two that struck me the most were the execution wall 
or death wall, along with the courts set up by the Gestapo and the Waffen-SS. In the case of the courts, an accused person, usually a Jew, was brought before a tribunal of Gestapo and SS officials with no jury of peers. The accused had no lawyer and no chance to defend him or herself. The Nazis presented a fabricated case against the accused and convicted the person, usually within a matter of minutes. Once convicted, the accused were told to remove their clothes and let out to an adjacent courtyard where they were shot in the back by the guards. Hundreds of innocent Jews, Catholics, Roma Gypsies, Communists, and others were executed in this manner. One of the exhibits at Auschwitz is the display case full of Zyklone B containers, which was the gas used to exterminate the Jews in the gas chambers. Many times, when they were being taken to the gas chambers, they did not know if they were simply going to take a shower or if they were going to be killed. The first gas chamber was built at Auschwitz I with gas chambers 2, 3, 4, and 5 being built at Auschwitz II Beer Canal. The first gas chamber had a hole in the ceiling for the gas to be poured through. The Nazis would make the other prisoners drive the bodies out, clean, and repaint the gas chambers. The bodies were then disposed of in mass graves. Many times, bodies were burned in the crematorium. The ashes were then put in large pits. To this day, people are still walking on the ashes of those murdered at Auschwitz, which was one of the most chilling parts of the concentration camp for me. Birkenau is sometimes known as Auschwitz II because it is part of the Auschwitz camp system. It is here that most of the mass gassing of prisoners took place. Prisoners were brought to the camp and pa packed into cattle cars such as this one. Arriving at Birkenau, these cattle cars would pass through this entrance. This entrance is ominous and is sometimes referred to as the gate to hell. At the concentration camp, the imprisoned Jews were housed in barracks. The barracks were often dirty and overcrowded. Many slept anywhere from two to four to a bed. The beds were made of wooden slabs resembling bunk beds stacked on top of each other. In the back left corner of Auschwitz-Birkenau are the remains of the gas chambers. Many of the prisoners were removed from the cattle cars and immediately marched to the gas chambers where Zyklon B gas was dropped from the ceiling, killing everyone inside. After all were killed, the Nazis would have the other prisoners remove the dead from the gas chambers and put them in the crematorium. Later, in 1944, when the Allies were pushing towards Berlin, the Nazis decided to demolish the gas chambers in the hope of eliminating any evidence of the atrocities that were taking place inside the camp. The citizens around the camp could only speculate what had been happening in the camp, though the smoke and orange hue rising from the crematoriums gave them an idea of the atrocities that were taking place inside Birkenau. It was only when the Allies liberated the camp that the worst fears of not only the citizens around Birkenau, but the fears and speculations of the entire world were confirmed. After cremating the people who were gassed, the ashes were thrown into pits as mass graves and, closer to the end of the war, scattered on the grounds of the camp. When walking through the camp, we were walking on the ashes of those who were killed at Birkenau. Today, there are markers placed in front of one of the mass graves reading, to the memory of the men, women, and children who fell victim to the Nazi genocide. Here lie their ashes, may their souls rest in peace. In Hebrew, English and Polish. Our tour guide said, we have to tell the truth because too many lies were told about this place. It is our duty to recognize the importance of human life and always work to protect it. One of the greatest heroes of the Holocaust is undoubtedly 
Oskar Schindler. It is undeniable that the work done by Schindler during the Holocaust makes him a hero. However, most do not know that Schindler did not start out as a Jewish sympathizer. Schindler first opened a factory in Warsaw that specialized in enamelware products. The majority of the people hired to work at this factory were Jews. However, this was not done out of sympathy. Schindler hired Jews because under Nazi law, Jews did not receive payment for their work, whereas non-Polish Jewish workers had to be paid. From the beginning, Schindler was an opportunist who saw Jews as an economic opportunity to further his own fortune. He had a change of heart, however, when Itzhak Stern, his Jewish accountant, whom he did not even have to pay, brought the troubles of the Jewish people to Schindler's attention. Schindler went on to spend almost every cent he had to hire Jews in order to protect them from the Nazis. He developed such a strong pro-Jewish stance that he even went to Auschwitz personally to retrieve 200 Jewish factory workers. The actions of Oskar Schindler made him one of the greatest heroes of the Holocaust. In fact, he was so loved by those that he saved that when Schindler was down on his luck later in life, the Jews he saved returned the favor and took care of him. Whoever saves one life saves the world entire, is a quote from the Talmud, the Jewish holy book. This particular quote has become most commonly associated with the Holocaust, particularly referring to anyone who helped save lives during the Holocaust. This quote essentially means that if one person is saved, a multitude of stories, legacies, and histories can live on through them. The finest example of the saving of lives during the Holocaust is Oskar Schindler, but the quote also applies to all the brave men and women who valiantly did their part to save as many people as they could during the Holocaust. It is because of their selfish, selfless actions that the stories of thousands upon thousands from the Holocaust, living and dead, live on. After two days in Krakow, we made our way by bus to Prague in the Czech Republic. The Jewish quarter in Prague, Czech Republic, was almost perfectly preserved because Hitler wanted to bring all of the belongings he had confiscated from the Jews and make a museum here. He planned on calling it the Museum of the Extinct Race. The old new synagogue was built in the 1500s. The walls are now covered in thousands of children's names in memory of those murdered during the Holocaust. Out of the 10,000 children who lived in this Jewish quarter, only 241 of them survived. The Spanish synagogue was built in the Moorish style in 1868 and is said to be the most beautiful synagogue in Europe. It is a less orthodox synagogue because there are pews in the worship space and the Torah is read from the front of the room rather than from the middle. Prague is a city rich in history and culture, most especially Jewish history and culture. And nothing is a greater testament to that than the Jewish cemetery in the old Jewish quarter. The cemetery was built and has been used since the 15th century with the oldest tombstone dating back to 1439 belonging to Avigor Kara. The cemetery is rather small, so in places the tombstones are stacked seven, eight, or even ten right on top of each other. In fact, there are 12,000 visible tombstones, but it is believed that there are as many as 100,000 or more Jewish men, women, and children buried in the cemetery. The cemetery shows how Prague had such a rich history and culture that became an inseparable, an, an inseparable part of the Czech Republic's culture and society, though the, present, the Jewish presence has not been able to recover since the end of World War II. After World War II ended, the total population of Jews living in Germany was 3,700. To this day, Germany has one of the lowest Jewish populations in all of Europe. After all of the atrocities had taken place, 
only 45,000 Jews remained in Poland, compared to the 3 million before the war. Only 17,000 of the roughly 357,000 360,000 Czechoslovakian Jews survived the war. In total, out of the 9.5 million Jews that lived in Europe before World War II, only 3.5 million survived. Ten days is by no means a vast expanse of time. However, over those 10 days at the beginning of July, I learned infinitely more than I could have ever hoped. Visiting sites such as the Babelplatz and Auschwitz-Birkenau allowed me to more deeply understand the suffering and injustice that took place in Europe some 70 years ago. The images of the piles of shoes, hair, suitcases, and piles of gold teeth are stark reminders of this injustice and hatred that will forever be ingrained into my mind. However, the most significant epiphany I experienced is that injustice is still just as strong a force in our world today, possibly even stronger than it was 70 years ago. It is all around us, so much so, in fact, that we seem to have become impervious to it. The Cambodian genocide, during which 25% of the population of Cambodia perished, is just one example. School shootings like Columbine and Sandy Hook, and most recently, the shooting in San Bernardino, provide further examples of violence in our world. Still, through all this, we are left with a simple question. What can I do to help? We must not wait idly on the sidelines, telling ourselves that someone else will take care of the problem. We owe it to each other to speak out for one another, because as Martin Niemöller said, first, they came for the socialists, but I did not speak out because I was not a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists, but I did not speak out because I was not a trade unionist. Then they came for the Jews, but I did not speak out because I was not a Jew. Then they came for me, and there was no one left to speak out for me. My journey along the path of the Holocaust was an eye-opening experience. Through my study of the Holocaust, I realized that the Jewish people affected by this terrible genocide were just like me. These people were children, mothers, fathers, husbands, wives. They were ripped from their homes and subjected to unthinkable acts of dehumanization. By following the path of the Holocaust, from the beginnings of Nazism in Berlin, to the ghetto in Warsaw, to the concentration camps in Krakow, and to the Jewish quarter in Prague, I learned of the heinous dehumanizing acts that the Nazis performed and the terror they brought to many different groups of people, primarily Jews. However, I also learned of the many brave men and women who worked against the Nazis to bring about justice and who showed great courage in times of fear. I am inspired by the bravery shown even at the darkest of times. I also gained a greater realization of the need for tolerance and understanding between different types of people. I am now more in tune to the needs of others and realize that even though we may not all share the same beliefs, we are all humans and we all deserve to be treated as such. I believe that we must treat each other with kindness and respect and we can never forget what happened during this dark time in history. Because of what I saw and learned on my trip to Europe, I promise to speak up for those who cannot when I see intolerance, and I will always work to create a world in which people can live without fear by promoting respect and understanding in all aspects of discussion and teamwork situations through the clubs and organizations in which I take part. I am Abigail Slezak, and over the course of 10 days, which I spent in Germany, Poland, and the Czech Republic studying the Holocaust, my life has been impacted in a number of ways. While in Berlin, Germany, I learned that the power of fear which Hitler instilled in his people was a powerful thing. 
From this, I now know how dangerous it is to sit back and be a bystander in any situation. The world that we live in today is a much different place, but the power of fear and hate is still present. For example, ISIS. It is up to us, the youth of our world, to not sit back and be bystanders, but rather stand up for what is right and help those who cannot help themselves. While I was in Warsaw and Krakow, Poland, I learned the importance of tolerance and acceptance. Visiting the notorious death camps of Auschwitz and Birkenau was the most surreal experience of the entire trip. It has opened my eyes to how ignorant we can be. Hating is an easy thing to do, but what is hard to do is to love. I learned that in order to be accepting of others and tolerant of those around me, I must first love. I learned Finally, that the most important thing that this educational trip has taught me in Prague, Czech Republic, was the value of education. The world must continue to educate everyone on the atrocities that took place in these countries during World War II. For if we continue this education, the Holocaust will never be forgotten. Not only will we be remembering the 6.1 million souls who were murdered during this time, but we are also preventing another such act from occurring. It is time to eliminate hate once and for all, and that starts with small acts of kindness, such as standing up for my classmates when they are being bullied. One person can make a difference, and I intend to be that one person. On behalf of my fellow travelers and teachers at Bishop McCord Catholic High School, I wish to offer my most sincere gratitude and thanks to everyone for listening and learning more about this momentous period in world history. I hope that you learned a great deal, and I hope that you too will help to spread the same message of hope, peace, and remembrance that we are trying to spread. I would like to again thank the Community Foundation of the Alleghenies and Abe and Janet Bierman, whom we fondly remember. Without their support, none of this would have been possible. I also wish to thank Mr. Mark Pascarella, who helped to secure the grant to help send us to Europe on this life-changing experience. Finally, I wish to thank Mr. Kane from the Community Foundation of the Alleghenies, who agreed to send us on this journey. Without you, none of this would have been possible. Again, I thank you.